Good afternoon. <laughs> Better. Welcome to the Entrepreneurship Forum. Today, I uh, I want to introduce a guy that I met a couple of years ago, and um, he's been gracious to come uh, back. I've been down and seen his uh, his shop, and um, he does a great job. He also goes up to the University of Utah tailgate, and. Um, Serves a lot of people, and uh, and this is uh, uh, Kevin has a situation that says that uh, I enjoy what I do, work can be fun, and I can make a lot of money, and so that's uh, that's what he does. He uh, he does this barbecue sauce. There's uh, three different kinds, and uh, and they're all good. So without further ado, I'm going to turn the time over to Kevin Jones. Let's give him a hand. You know, two out of three ain't bad. Huh? Two out of three ain't bad. I enjoy what I do. I have fun with it, but I haven't seen a lot of money yet. <laughs> that puts you in the Hall of Fame, you know, two out of three. You know, when you dress like that, that means you got to be making a lot of money. When I dress like this, it means I ain't making sauce. <laughs> Good morning, or afternoon, or evening, whatever it is for y'all. Uh, my name's Kevin Jones. I am the chief sauce maker and founder of Snap Daddy's Barbecue Sauce. How many of y'all have heard of Snap Daddy's? Yeah? So not many of you. Good. How many of you tried it before? What do you think? It's okay. It's all right? Where are you from? I'm originally from Florida, but I've lived in Memphis, so... I mean, you know. Yeah, you have, and it's and it's all different flavor. I mean, you got a different barbecue sauce down in Florida than you do in Memphis and you do in Texas. I prefer a dry rub myself. There you go, there you go. What I'd like to talk to you today in the School of Entrepreneurship is, uh, and we get to choose our topics. Fortunately, or I'd have nothing to talk about, but um, is to think out of the box. So that's going to be the title of this lecture. Think out of the box. If you can't read my handwriting, it's because I only spent 10 years in college to get my associate's degree. You can relate to that? Yeah. <laughs> Um, let me give you a quick history of our company. My background is supply chain management, logistics, transportation, and freight optimization. In layman terms, that means making sure the right product is at the right place at the right time for the cheapest cost. Some of you may have heard of a little company called Dell. They make computers. I don't see any in here. They're all apples, but that's all right. <laughs> Oh, okay, there's one right there. So I helped build their just-in-time inventory system where they would decrement inventory on the line and that's when you as a vendor would get paid for it and they would take your money in the beginning, you as a customer, they'd build your, cu your computer and as it went down the line and they added pieces to that computer, every time it pulled out of inventory, that's when you got paid as the vendor. I helped build that. A little company called Frito-Lay Chip Company we helped them make a more streamlined potato chip, believe it or not, because they had to go through so many touch points. Touch points is every time you touch the item before it gets to the customer. And we helped streamline that process. Worked on a little project with a company called Chrysler Jeep. And they were, not, they were launching this new product called a Liberty. It was a new car. And we did the research and helped them because they couldn't produce enough of them. And we tried to figure out why. And it had to do with a purchasing of the clay that they used to make the pistons. Uh, and the gal who was buying the clay had negotiated the price down so much, the clay producer said, look, I'm not going to sell it to you. I'm going to sell it to the kitty litter company cost them tens of millions of dollars in the end, hundreds of millions of dollars in the end for a few cents up front. Uh, and I know I'm boring you, so I apologize. 
That's what I used to do. In 2009, I came here to Salt Lake and uh, couldn't buy an interview in my profession. So I started working for a mortgage company. Now for me, that was like drinking water from a fire hydrant trying not to die of dehydration. Absolutely hated it. Hated it. I'm tied to a cube. I'm on my phone all day long. And could never get up barely to go to the bathroom or eat. So I packed my lunch. And in the winter of 09, 010, some of you may not remember that far back, but we had a lot of snow. I hated it, because I moved here in July. And I was wondering what the hell I got myself into. Here I am, I hate my job, I hate the snow, I hate the, why did I move here, really? And my little girl, who'd never known life outside of Texas, hated it too. And she came to me one day and she says, Daddy, I'm homesick. I says, you and me both, baby. She says, could you just go outside and cook me a good meal like you did back home? And reality is it was snowing. And there was snow piled up on a grill, so I shoveled it off. I started cooking because, you know, that's what daddies do for their little girls. And I came back in to warm up and she says, Daddy, will you do me a favor? Will you make that really good barbecue sauce you make? I says, yeah, no problem. She says, but this time will you write down the recipe? You got to understand, this was my measuring cup back then. Some of y'all been there. A little dab of this, a little dab of that. I says, honey, why do you want me to write down the recipe? She goes, well, I don't want to say it too loud, Dad. But you're getting kind of old. And I just want your grandkids to know what a good cook you were. Past tense. She was 13. She's now y'all's age. So I wrote it down. And uh, that was kind of the beginning of the end. Because back then, we used to take old ketchup bottles and we'd pour our sauce into it, and I'd take it to work. And I'd always put it on my food. And you get these guys walking past, and they smell it, whatever you're eating for lunch, and they're like, hey, uh, can I try that? Sure, no problem. The mistake was that pretty soon you're packing lunch for like seven or eight guys <laughs> every day. And one day this guy walked up to me, he says, I gotta tell you, he says, I never knew that it could be so easy. It would taste so good. It'd actually be good for you, all the food that you take and all the food that you cook. You've changed up my, me and my family's life. He says, but I gotta tell you, that barbecue sauce you make, I think that's the best barbecue sauce I've ever had. Can I have the recipe? Before I could say anything, the guy standing next to me says, Kev, whatever you do, don't get rid of that recipe. I think you can make some money on that. <laughs> like, y'all are crazy. Crazy stupid. <laughs> Nobody's going to pay good money for barbecue sauce. There's a thousand of them out there. There's a hundred new ones every day. Everybody's got their own family recipe. Nobody's going to pay good money for barbecue sauce. He goes, no, seriously. I think you can make some money off of it. So I looked at the dude. I said, I'll tell you what. I'll bring you a bottle but I won't give you the recipe. Let me think about it. He says, okay. So the next day I bring him a bottle. I go home that night and I tell my wife what they had said at work. Somebody thinks we can make some money out of this barbecue sauce. She goes, I think you're right. I think they're right. I said, I think y'all are crazy. You're as dumb as they are. <laughs> Nobody's gonna pay good money for barbecue sauce. Nobody. I was a dumb one. <laughs> I didn't think out of the box. And what made a difference for us is we started doing uh, farmer's markets. And the only people that would take us was Bountiful, big metropolis of Bountiful, just north of here. And at the time, we could make four 12-ounce bottles in a batch. And we made 36 bottles. 
And we took it up there and we started sampling. We didn't even know what we were doing sampling. We literally put the tailgate down on my truck, sat on the bed of the tailgate and said, hey, you want to try our product? <laughs> we didn't know what we were doing. We put it in the little cup, handed it to them, and they look at us and they're like, well, what are we supposed to do with this? <laughs> supposed to shoot it, stick my finger in it? <laughs> yeah, stick your finger in it. That'll be finger licking good. You know what I'm saying? But we ended up selling out. Halfway through the market, we sold out. And then we came home and we said, okay, we'll go back again because that was just a fluke. And when this week, we made 72 bottles. And we went back up there. And as we're setting up, because this time we brought a table. <laughs> we had a lot of setup to do. We set up, we had our little cups, we had our sample stuff. As we're setting up, my daughter says, Daddy, look across the way. There's a guy selling bread. Yeah, and we don't have any money to buy bread. She goes, I know. Why don't you take one of our bottles and go over and trade him for a loaf of bread? I don't want any bread. <laughs> no, Dad, if you trade him for a loaf of bread, you can bring it back. We'll cut it up. And we'll put it in the cups and the people have something to sample it on. That's exactly what I was going to do. <laughs> so I walked over and I traded out a bottle of sauce for a loaf of bread, came back, cut it up, and this week we didn't hear any complaints about, hey, what am I supposed to do with this? <laughs> Funny thing is, we ended up selling 72 bottles. Halfway through the show, we had to pass out samples. So the next week we came home, we worked really, really, really hard, made 144 bottles. We go back, we're pros of this now, three times. <laughs> we got our table, we got our sample cups, we swap out for another loaf of bread, we're ready, we even brought a knife this time. <laughs> we're that good. And we set up and we start sampling. And we end up selling 142 of those 144 bottles. It was then and only then that I came home and my wife asked, how'd you do? I said, you know what? You may be onto something. You may be onto something. At work, the same guy who asked for the recipe the first time now comes back, because it's been three weeks. He says, hey, I went through that bottle of barbecue sauce. Can I have another one? It was then that we adopted the philosophy of every good drug dealer. First hit's free. <laughs> And then you'll pay for it the rest of your life. <laughs> so this time we decided to sell to him. And then we started selling bottles out of the desk at my mortgage company office. <laughs> then one day I came home and I found out my mom was diagnosed with breast cancer. And I'm trying to run her to the hospital, trying to run her to treatment, trying to do my damn job. Wondering why the hell I made it another year. What am I doing here? I went home and I sat down on the couch. I just wanted to cry. My wife walks in and she says, you look miserable. I said, you think? Seriously, you think? My mom's dying. I hate my job. It's starting to get cold again. I'm wondering why the hell I'm here. <laughs> she says, I got an idea for you. You know that barbecue sauce? I said, yeah. She says, why don't you quit your job? I says, you're an idiot. How are we going to pay our bills? She says, no, just hear me out. Hear me out. Quit your job and take care of your mom because we don't know if she's going to make it or not. And when she's recovering from her chemo and all that other crap she has to go through, get on the Internet keep a journal, and figure out what it's going to take to make that into a business. <coughs> she says, I says, that's all good and dandy, but how are we going to pay our bills? She says, I'll make a deal with you. She says, if you quit your job, you take care of your mom, and you research what it's going to take to make this into a business, I'll work two, three, four jobs if that's what it takes to get us by. She goes, you got to promise me one thing. 
I said, what's that? She says, you never quit. Don't you ever quit. You quit on me, it's done. But don't you ever quit. And little did I know how easy it was to say, okay, and live up to that it was so much more difficult. Because as an entrepreneur, you got good days, you got bad days, you got fun days, you got days you want to forget. Truth is, when you're doing what you love, and you love what you're doing, it's not work. It's fun. And just like when it's good days and bad days, the bad days are to remind you why you're having good days, and the good days are to remind you that you got through the bad days. And the advice that I gave my son, who I've fired three times now, <laughs> the first little bit of advice I gave him when he showed up to late work or up to work late was I said, son, when you own your own business, nobody really gives a damn what time you go to bed. Nobody really cares what time you get up. Nobody even really cares if you deliver what you say you're going to deliver. But if you don't care, nobody else will. So think about that. If you decide and you're crazy enough to start a business, you want to work for yourself because it's going to be easy, you're going to make millions of bucks. Go see a psychiatrist first, it's going to be cheaper. <laughs> But if you do decide to make that leap, jump. Don't stick your toe in. Don't dibble dabble. Don't worry if it's warm or cold. Jump. And if you can't swim, try like hell to learn. That's my advice for you. Now some people, or nine to fivers. Some people have to have that hourly wage and some people have to have that guaranteed paycheck at the end of the week. If that's you and you have to live like that because you have to have that assurance that you're going to get paid money at the end of the week, don't start a business. Don't do it. It's not for you. But if you're that individual that has and enjoys no hours because all your hours are dedicated to your job, I said to my wife last night when the phone rang at 9 o'clock, one of these days I'm going to get a 9 to 5 job and I won't answer this phone. Won't do it. You've been there, you know what I'm talking about. Some restaurant runs out of sauce, they got to have a gallon of it t 10 minutes ago. Oh, I'm sorry, your planning constitutes my emergency? Your lack of planning? The fact is, when you own your own business, you're thinking about it all the time. All the time. What am I doing right? What am I doing wrong? How do I fix it? How do I expand? Should I contract? Those are all questions that you're going to face. So that's a little bit of history of our company. The reason I've entitled this Think Out of the Box is because we're just dumb rednecks that make barbecue sauce. <laughs> okay? But in Texas, in Memphis, that's Tennessee, bubble gum, baling wire, and duct tape can fix anything. <laughs> bubble gum, baling wire, and duct tape. There is nothing broke. It's just how we're gonna fix it. And that's how we are. We didn't know what we were doing. We had no idea about the food industry, what we were getting into. And in three years that we've been in business, first of all, let me back up. If you're good enough in the food business, if you're good enough and your product's good enough, you're going to be lucky to get on a grocery store shelf, one grocery store, one shelf in the first two years. You'll be lucky. So grandma's recipe, I don't care how good it is, I don't care how many people ask you to make it at Thanksgiving and Christmas. Just remember, on average, two years, one store, one shelf, if you're good enough. We've been in business 
about 39 months, a little over three years. June 1st was our three-year anniversary. In that time, we are now distributing our product in nine different states, nearly 600 grocery stores, and 135 commercial accounts. And one of these days, we'll figure out what the hell we're doing. <laughs> you know? Because we're just dumb rednecks that make sauce for a living. And in that same amount of time, we've counseled about 60 different companies. And I can tell you five of them, five or six of them, they're in at least 20 stores or more. But one of these days, we'll figure out what we're doing so we can expand and grow. One of the things we learned is the difference between a codependent product and an independent product. Now, how many of you have been to a 7-Eleven or a convenience store or even to the grocery store and picked up something like grapes, potato chips, or a soda? Everyone. Everybody? Okay. How many of y'all have broken into those grapes, chips, or soda either in line to pay for it or shortly thereafter on your way to the car and just took a little? Everybody? Okay, how many of y'all have bought a bottle of barbecue sauce in a grocery store, popped it open before you got in line to pay for it, and or on your way to the car and just took a swig? <laughs> no? Why not? Why not? You need something to go with it. That makes us a codependent product. What I tell grocery stores, the reason you want us on your shelf is because we drive foot traffic into your grocery store. You could give our, our product away for free, and you're still going to make money. Well, how's that? Because they still got to buy bread and meat and chips and salad and whatever else to complete their barbecue. Average, average ticket price when they buy a bottle of our product is between 35 and 45 bucks. Make your money off of somebody else, because you ain't going to make it off me. Because I'm going to drive the business to your store. Now, how do we do that? You've been to Memphis. How many pit master competitions did you see? How many of y'all know what a pit master competition is? Every weekend. Very few. How many of y'all know what the Super Bowl is? <laughs> oh, a few more. <laughs> yeah, I'd rather be the official tailgate sauce for the NFL Super Bowl than I would the grand champion pitmaster. It's a bigger market. It's a bigger market, more eyes. Exactly. So we set out a goal to be associated with the number one talk show station in, in the market. Then we figured, ah, oh, country probably fits into our demographics. So we want to team up with a country radio station. Oh, and hard rock probably matches up with our demographics. So we decided to team up with a hard rock station. And we started out with ESPN Radio. Some of you may have heard our commercials. Yeah? What was nice, probably because you don't listen to ESPN, it's 700 on the AM dial. Yeah, that's why. Yeah. What's nice is when you go into Associated to get into their warehouse, and the buyer says, I never tried your product, but I hear your ads on the radio all the time. What's nice is when you go into Harmon's and the buyer at Harmon says, I got one question for you. At the end of all your radio ads, you say, now available at Harmon's. You're here to talk about a marketing campaign. Why do you do that? Just paying it forward. I know that you need the foot traffic. You guys are really good to us. I'm paying it forward. <coughs> He says, all right, what did you have in mind for a marketing campaign? I said, I have no idea. You're the expert. Because <laughs> that's the other lesson I learned. And I'm not joking when I say this. We're just dumb rednecks that make barbecue sauce for a living. And whenever we have come across an issue or a topic that we don't know about, we try to surround ourselves with the smartest people we can find in that given situation. A lot of you don't know Professor Lambert is a banking expert. 
That's kind of how we met. I was bouncing checks all over. He wanted to know why. No, I'm just kidding. But we surround ourselves with the best people we can find, the smartest people we can find. And then we're dumb enough to listen to them. It's amazing what they have to say. Amazing. So I said to Harmons, I says, well, you're the expert. What do you want to do? He says, all right. I have carte blanche. I says, yeah, go ahead. He says, all right, let's put it on sale for the month of September. We'll run an ad the second week of September. We'll run an ad for you uh, right before Super Bowl. We'll have you come in and sample this store, this store, this store. He goes down the whole list. I says, man, that's amazing. He says, we'll even pass out, we'll even print off 5,000 coupons that are good to any Harmon store, and uh, they'll have two for six bucks. Man, that's amazing. I says, how much is it gonna cost me? He goes, nothing. I said, what do you mean, nothing? He goes, I'm just paying it back. Now that's a $15,000 ad campaign. Nothing. For commercial spots that I should be paying $47,000 for for this year, and I pay nothing. And why do I pay nothing? Because when ESPN Radio calls me up and they say, hey, we need some food. We're doing a live remote. One of which is tomorrow at Qual Paint up in Sugar House. Can you do the food for us? Well, the funny thing is I'm codependent. I'm just, I'm just a sauce maker. I'm not a caterer. And when they first came to me the first time, I said, I don't know, let me get back to you. And I picked up Colosimo, I picked up the phone, I called Colosimo, I said, hey, I've got this opportunity with ESPN Radio. You in? He says, I won't give you any money. I'll give you all the product you need. And then in one of the food shows, I saw Sarah Lee. I picked him up, I says, hey, I got this opportunity with ESPN Radio. I won't give you any money, but I'll give you all the product you need. And then at this booth right next to me, another Utah's own company, Fat Boy Ice Cream was standing right there. I says, hey, Don, buddy, pal. <laughs> Barbecue sauce goes really good with ice cream. <laughs> <laughs> Which actually we have a recipe like that on our website that uses our barbecue sauce. I says, I got this opportunity with ESPN Radio. He goes, I won't, give you any I won't give you any money, but I'll give you all the product you need. So I picked up the phone and I called ESPN Radio. Yeah, this is what we're going to serve. We're going to serve brats, Sara Lee buns, Colosimo brats, Sara Lee buns, a little fat boy ice cream on the side for dessert, and topped with Snap Days barbecue sauce. Perfect. How much did that cost me? Oh, it did. <laughs> cost me my time. Cost me some sauce. But if you measure apples for apples, that's a $47,000 contract that'll probably end up costing me about five grand when you figure in time, product, and everything else. And the nice thing is, I pay as I go. It's not all up front. And what do they get in return? They've actually got $100,000 contracts because Snap Daddy's is going to do live remotes for them. Qualpate is a prime example. They're fixing to lose that account. We came in and did a remote for them where they're averaging 20, 30 people coming in. They got 185. The next week we did one for Dish Pro. We only had 60 people. I thought, oh crap, we failed miserably and they're going to fire us. It was then and only then that the radio host cornered me after the thing. He goes, you're tearing it up, man. Tearing it up. I says, dude, I'm sorry. We only serve 60 people. He goes, you know, I've done 20 to 30 live remotes here at this very location. And in the past, we've, ordered, we've had an average of two people attend. You had four people walk off the street today and sign up for Dish Pro. They're ecstatic. 
And that story has repeated itself time and time and time again. And now ESPN has invited us to do the food for their VIPs and other dignitaries up at the U whenever, and it's not, it's not just ESPN now, it's actually expanded across all of Broadway media. So the Eagle, X96, Rewind 100.9, you know, there's six or seven radio stations. I had a really cool thing happen to me last week. Excuse me, I gotta get a drink. It's vodka. <laughs> <laughs> had a really cool experience happen to me. A little guy by the name of Keith Urban. Y'all ever hear about him? He was in concert here last week or so ago. And my wife and I got to go to it. It was our 14th concert this summer. It's pretty cool. It's the first one we didn't work, which was really cool. <laughs> you know? But we do VIP tents for them. Again, for the very reason that I don't really care about being a pit master. Sweet Baby Ray, Stubbs, Famous Daves, they pride themselves on being pit masters. Great, good on you. I'm just the official barbecue sauce at Telegates for the University of Utah. I'm just the official barbecue sauce for the Salt Lake Real. I'm just the official barbecue sauce for Utah Jazz. I'm just the official barbecue sauce for tailgates across the NCAA. Whatever it's gonna become, you know? I'm not there yet. I will be. I will be. But again, that's the out of the box thinking. So let me talk, I'm gonna divert away from Snap Days for just one hair of a second. And I wanna talk about another Utah's own company that is a fantastic company. They don't even know what I'm talking about. But this is the out of the box thinking that I wanted to show. This little company is called Roosters Popcorn Boosters. Now Roosters Popcorn, Gourmet Popcorn, is down South Jordan at the district. It's really cool. They have a storefront. They can make any color and any flavor of popcorn you want. And I ain't kidding. This particular flavor is ranch, like ranch salad dressing. It goes really, really good, and I was gonna bring it with the buffalo flavor. So you have like wings and ranch on your popcorn. How do you beat that? But my wife ate it. <laughs> the reason I wanna bring them up is because Holly, who's the proprietor, is an MBA. She has her MBA. And I deal a lot with those kind of guys. I'm not that smart. I went to school for 10 years, and I finally realized there's a difference between 10 years and tenure. <laughs> 10 years you're still paying. Tenure they pay you. <laughs> Just so you know, in case you haven't learned that lesson yet. <laughs> okay? So I started at Dixie, then went to this little school in Texas. I still say it with pride, even though we got our butts kicked last weekend by some team here in town. Anyway, and I, I barely, barely got my bachelor's degree. And my degree is in general studies. And the reason it's in general studies is because I was a year away from getting a degree in mathematics. I was a year away from getting a degree in economics. I was a year away from getting a degree in Spanish, English, <laughs> computer science. I think creative writing was the other one. There was six of them. It wouldn't have been creative writing. There was six of them. I know, I know it was crazy. And I called up my uncle, who happened to be the CFO of Nissan North America at the time. I said, Winston, I highly respect you. You make tons of money. I want to be just like you. What should I get my degree in? Which one of these six is going to... You got six choices. Which one's going to promote me faster to be on your path? He goes, Kev, my degree's in history. What does that tell you? 
<laughs> because I was only a semester away from getting my degree in general studies. So my point being, so I went to the University of Texas and I got a piece of paper and a hat. While you're talking, go ahead. Okay. I got a piece of paper and a hat. And I wear the hat all the time. All the time. And when I was talking to him and he told me what it is, he says what's more important is not the paper. That's the key to the door to your future. What's important is what you do once you open the door. <laughs> so, back to roosters. This little company came to me. Now they already have a storefront, and I don't even know what he's riding behind me, and I don't care. <laughs> this, this little company came to me. They had a storefront. They had this idea to put their flavorings in a jar and, um, and sell it. I said, yeah, that's a great idea. You know, I got these jars, about 13,000 of them, because that's what we were going to put our sauce in to begin with, and it didn't quite work out. I'll sell them to you for cheap. They happen to work perfect for her and what she's doing. She goes, you know, I got this neighbor. His name's Dan Carr. Anybody know who that is? He was on TV a little bit last week. <laughs> Just, just put SS, you'll be fine. <laughs> who, knows what I, who knows what he's done like? No rednecks in here? How about? In the chicken coop. You gotta add that part. You wanna make him mad so he's done like an Aggie. <laughs> yeah, that would do it. And you, the door's right there. <laughs> this conversation is over. <laughs> so anyway, she comes to me and she says, I got this really good neighbor and I'm really good friends with his wife. His name's Dan Farr. Anybody know who Dan Farr is? Comic-Con. Comic-Con. Who said that? Comic-Con is right. He's the guy who does Comic-Con of which I get nothing about. <laughs> but we'll talk about that later. Because we support Comic-Con too. Anyway, she says, I get this booth for free. And my goal is, is to have this stuff in a jar so I can sell it at Comic-Con. Man, that'd be great. 120,000 people come through. Let's just do the numbers. You only need like 1% to stop by your booth and buy. At five bucks, that's five grand. That's not bad for three days. She goes, great, I'm going to do it. So she buys the bottles from me. She needs help with her label. I help her with that. She gets, she's got this great product, yada, yada, yada. She calls me up a couple days later. She goes, I'm so depressed. You know, I invested all that money into those jars. I had what I thought was a great idea. And they won't let me sell popcorn at the Salt Palace. So why? They already have this contract with this company called Kettle Corn, and they, that's an exclusive. They don't allow any other popcorn vendors in there. I don't know what I'm going to do. I've invested all this money into doing this thing. Let's think out of the box. What do you do? And I throw that out. This is a participation class. You get that booth right next to Kettle Corn. Yeah. And? Have her put her topping on their popcorn. Okay. What else? Take something else, like an alternative chicken or something, put her seasoning on it, be good or else. You can't do that either because they got a food contract. Buy the <coughs> popcorn from Kettle Corn, sell it for booth. Okay. What else? Yeah. Call it something else. Like what? Something other than popcorn. Popcorn. Huh? I don't know. Just call it some other name. Okay. And when I walk by and I see that it's popcorn, <laughs> do I get to shut your booth down then? 
I can call it another name other than eviction. <laughs> no, I'm just asking, seriously. Any other ideas? Maybe you can say outside by the door where they, they have to, like, if they're entering or coming up. One more time. Like, maybe you can set it by the door where they have to come in or come out so that I can see you. You'll not know, be inside, but outside. Um, you could, but then you run into health issues, health department issues, and they're a lot harder to deal with than the people at Salt House. <laughs> <laughs> just saying. I've had to deal with them. Okay. Yeah? Sauce, and then have that just sold on the side, like so that way the, the goes in under you, barbecue sauce, and then like the seasoning would be like a sidekick kind of thing. <coughs> all great ideas. <coughs> no, they are all great ideas. You know, I told her you're not selling popcorn, you're giving popcorn away, you're selling toppings to popcorn. Is that not true? true. Didn't lie. You're going to make this, put it on your popcorn. You're going to give that away so they can taste it, and you're going to sell this. That's a brilliant idea, she says. <laughs> now, did we accomplish the same thing? Yeah. Bailey wire, duct tape, and bubble gum? We accomplished the same thing. We just called it something different and took a little spin on it. That's out of the box. You know, she only made about 10 grand that weekend. <coughs> Giving away popcorn, selling toppings. So I implore you, because I'm coming to the end and then we'll open it up for questions. One thing I did want to bring up, there is, and I actually did research, see there's my notes. <laughs> There's a guy by the name of Malcolm Gladwell, G-L-A-D-W-E-L-L. -L. He's written four books. First one he came out with was called Blink, Blink. Another one was called The Tipping Point. Another one was called Outliers, The Story of Success. And his latest is called David and Goliath. And I, re I bring that up for a reason. In the barbecue world, I'm David. And as long as I continue to think like David, I will become a Goliath. And I'm going to tell you the story of David and Goliath the way he says it, and hopefully I don't ruin the book for you. But he says Goliath in the day is seven feet tall. That's big in these days. And the average Israelite was a little over five feet tall. He had a wingspan of nearly nine feet. He wielded a sword that was five feet tall. And that's why, in all arrogance and cockiness, he stood out on that battleground. He said, bring me your best. Because the average five-foot Israelite ain't even going to get close and it took the thinking, the out-of-the-box thinking of this little kid, and I mean little, who happened to be a sheep herder. And he's pretty good with that damn slingshot. Finds a couple little rocks, and we all know the story. He walks over, and he flings the rock, and he knocks him down. He knocks him down because he didn't get within grips of, day, of Goliath getting to him. And he thought out of the box. What I like about Gladwell's analogy is he takes it a step further. And he finds some dude who studies ancient weaponry. Because that story's not true. No way. Rock. <coughs> slingshot. Giant drops dead. No way. But he finds this guy who analyzes and studies these ancient weaponry. And with science, he projects that when that rock left the sling of David's arm, it was traveling as fast as a 45 slug from a gun. And it hit him square in the middle of the forehead. Yeah, it killed him. 
just like a gun would today. So think out of the box. Remember your David whenever you start. Remember your David. You got one of two things when you start a business, and never the two shall marry. Number one, you got time, because nobody's buying your crap. Or number two, you got money, so you can convince people to buy your crap. <laughs> never the two shall twine when you're starting out. You either got a lot of money, or you got cash. I mean, time, or you got money. I challenge you, if you ever decide to get into this crazy arena called entrepreneurship, utilize your time and think to yourself, how would I do it if I had money? And once you've identified that, which is probably the easiest solution, pull out the bubble gum, the bailey wire, and the duct tape and fix it. Figure out how to make it work. Okay? Wish you the best of luck. I'll open it to questions. I have a question. Yeah. Are you selling your barbecue sauce today? I am not here, but actually the answer to that, let me think out of the box. Yes. <laughs> yes, I do. What grocery store do you shop at? I do go to Harmon's. We're in there. In Kearns? Yep. All right. We're there. You can buy it there. Can't buy it here. Thank you. You're welcome. I normally I bring samples. I have been running like crazy and I apologize for that. Um, and I just left a meeting and I didn't pack the truck right last night and I'm lucky to be here. <laughs> yeah. Why your logo is Why your logo is Why is my logo a bear? Uh -huh. That's a great question. Because what I did is I took a sheet of plywood and I cut it in half, and we had six different logos that we wanted to use or were thinking about using, and we put them on the plywood so it was kind of like this. So you had six on this side and the same six on this side. And then I went down to the corner of Main Street and Third West at lunchtime, and I asked total strangers, what logo do you like the best? That's the what one. So who asked that question? Three. Three. No, you, you get one. You get sweet kisses. <laughs> Do you like sweet stuff, like smoky sweet stuff, or hot? Smoky. Smoky, original. Okay. All right. Okay, that's yours. Thank you. Go ahead. My question is: is uh, from 2009, 2010, when did you actually buy your business license and start doing uh, the legal aspects of uh, getting your corporation going or your business going? I did because you can do cottage things, right? I didn't. I didn't start it. Uh, I didn't buy it until I identified it in October of 10, mm -hmm. and I think we bought it like February or March of 11. And we open our doors officially June 1st of 11. And that's where your anniversary is coming from. You know, that's what? That's when you, you're celebrating your 39 month running anniversary. Was yeah, June 1st is our, is our anniversary. That's what I thought. Since he's from Memphis, yeah. slapping he, hot. He doesn't even know what good barbecue sauce is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's fine. No, you're good. You don't want it? Go ahead. Anybody else you might want is fine. What's that? Snapdad. You want it? Okay. That's a great question. So I have my two youngest daughters. One's mine, one's my wife's, so my stepdaughter, right? Are two months and a day apart. So my little girl has played volleyball since nine years old. She's in an academy in Texas. And my stepdaughter has been a cheerleader since she was nine years old. Okay, so we have a volleyball player and a cheerleader, and we have all these ugly girls hanging out of the house. Because <laughs> their friends would come, our house was the local hangout, and all these ugly girls would come, and you get like cheerleaders and dance and drill team and volleyball players and whatever. I mean, just hideous. <laughs> and then you get the occasional stray dog that waits out of the mailbox. Hey, can I come in? No, go home. We don't allow boys in here. So one day they came in, because we were looking at a name. And one day they came in, and we would feed them. And I don't care what you say, but those girls eat more than guys of that age. 
and they came in after an event. They're like, oh, I'm starving. I'm so hungry, dying, wasting away to nothing. They said, Dad, can you cook for us? I says, yeah. And one of the girls goes, come on, Dad, snap to it, snap to it. Well, you got snap days. <laughs> Anything else? Yeah. Let's see here. We're everywhere from Utah State down to Dixie State. We're at the Capitol. We're at the Governor's Mansion. We're at uh, we're on five or six food trucks, and uh, you can jump on our website. Basically, that'll tell you. All right. Kevin Jones, Snap Daddies. Let's give him a hand.